Games tell stories. It's a shock, I know. But not all games tell stories in the same way. I think for many people, when they think of storytelling in games, they think of the cinematic approach. The sort you'd see in an Uncharted game, for example. For this new episode of Mellow Gaming Recommends, I thought I'd take a look at three fairly recent rad indie games that each have a different approach to storytelling, and how the gameplay feeds into this. Also, I'll just be gushing over the games themselves, because this wouldn't be a Recommends episode if I didn't. So, hi, I'm Ant, and welcome to Mellow Gaming Recommends. Three rad games, and how they tell stories. The first of the three games we'll be looking at is the one that tells a story in the most traditional manner. That game is Mediatonic's Murder by Numbers. It was released in early March of this year, that's 2020 for those of you in the future. It's a mashup of visual novel and Picross. Yes, that puzzle game with all the numbers where you make the pictures happen. In the game, you play as Ona Mizrahi, the co-star of a B-tier murder mystery show called Murder Miss Terry. Shortly after being fired from a role, for seemingly no reason, the show's producer is murdered in his office. Honor is a prime suspect and sets out to clear her name and maybe solve the mystery herself. She does this with the help of a strange robot called Scout that appears on the same day looking for a detective to help him piece together the mystery of his broken memories. Scout scans the environment for clues which you identify by solving Picross puzzles, and you use those clues to find the true culprits. The story is told over four chapters as Honor goes from being a TV detective to a real detective. I'm only going to be showing footage from the first case here in order to avoid revealing too much of the game's plot. Each case has its own self-contained episode that feeds into the overarching plot of the game. So let's take a look at how the story is told in case one, which is titled Show's Over. As the game starts, we're given a short tutorial on how to solve nonograms, more commonly known as Picross puzzles which are framed as a currently unknown to us computer trying to reboot its internal systems. It's a pretty great tutorial for Picross and should set you up for the puzzles you'll face up ahead. I really like the idea of using Picross as the method for uncovering clues. There's a sort of feeling of discovery as you find out what the clue is by creating an image in pixel art form. After completing the tutorial, our little computerised friend awakens in the junkyard, which establishes the game's first narrative plot. Who threw out a robot and why? Meanwhile, at a Hollywood studio in the mid-90s, oh, by the way, this game's set in the mid-90s, Honor is completing a few reshoots with her show's lead star, Becky, who plays the titular character, Miss Terry. Shortly after completing the scene, Honor is called to the studio office by the producer, Blake, who fires her from the show, making up some weak excuses as to why. Honor heads out to the car park to go home and figure out what she wants to do with her life, where she meets Scout, the robot from the junkyard, who asks her for help figuring out who he is. Honor can't find her keys and Scout offers to help, but he isn't exactly great at identifying things yet. When Honor heads back to the studio to look for her keys, she hears Becky scream and discovers that someone has killed Blake. The police are called and one detective cross arrives to lock the building down, making sure no one can enter and leave so he can find the murderer. Frustrated by the lockdown, hitting close to home there again, Honor and Scout identify a way out of the break room. They've been locked in via an air vent which leads to Blake's office. From here, Honor and Scout start piecing together the clues. Honor clears her name, but against Detective Cross's wishes, sticks around to figure out just what did happen. It turns out Blake may have been killed because of a sinister blackmail plot that was being carried out against him, a plot that will come up again in later chapters. As you can see, the story is told entirely via dialogue, as is the norm for a visual novel. It is following the traditional A to B plot progression of events linked together via new revelations and actions. You know, like in stories. The puzzles reveal clues you can present as evidence, and the truths that they uncover move you onto the next part of the story. Characters react in different ways to the evidence you present them, sometimes providing further clues to help you find the truth. It's all very Phoenix Wright-esque. What really helps this game stand out is the wit and humour of its dialogue, and the nicely fleshed out characters along with the well-structured mystery that rarely veers into a too predictable territory. As the game goes on, there's various plot revelations involving Honor, Scout and Detective Cross's past. It's a really well-told story and does a good job of keeping you entertained between puzzles. If the story didn't work well, then you'd be left with a Picross game where you'd end up skipping the dialogue to get to the next puzzle. That never happened for me though, because the mysteries were engaging and the characters are a joy to be around. I highly recommend Murder by Numbers. The first case takes about two and a half hours to finish, but the three cases after that, and the extra unlockable puzzles, should keep you busy for a good 20-ish hours. The game taught me a few Picross tricks I never picked up playing other games too. 
I was hooked on it and it's a strong contender for my top game of 2020 so far. Murder by Numbers is available on PC and Switch. It's designed by Ed Fear, who was the writer on Swords of Ditto, features art by Hato Moa, who created Hato for Boyfriend, and the music is by Masakazu Sugimori, who you may know from Beautiful Joe, Ghost Trick, and the Phoenix Wright games. Slay the Spire has become a bit of a big deal online these days. Everyone seems to be doing let's plays and live streams of it now. Game Maker's Toolkit has brought up the game in detail a few times in recent videos too. I imagine some people watching this will be familiar with the game, but it's always worth giving a bit of an explain to those who aren't. So, what is Slay the Spire? Slay the Spire is a deck builder roguelike with turn based RPG style combat. You work your way up a randomly generated tower, picking the route you think will best suit you, in order to reach the top for reasons that aren't entirely clear as you begin. Along the way you'll grab new cards to build out your deck that give you new attacks and skills to help you defeat the tower's fiendish array of monsters. So, how does storytelling feed into this? You may think this game lacks a story. There's no traditional cutscenes, the four characters you can pick from don't have backstories or plot lines to speak of. The story is really all about you and how you play. Every time you play your journey is a little different. You'll encounter different enemies and bosses, although each act has its own cast of monsters. You'll have different random events at these question mark spots which could be an encounter with a mysterious creature living in the tower, or a surprise enemy battle. Because of the randomness of your route up the tower, the cards you'll find and the enemies you'll encounter, the story is your story. You know when you're telling a friend about some moment in a game that was legendarily unique and awesome that you just had to tell them about it? Well, roguelikes such as Slay the Spire lend themselves very well to this. Your whole gameplay session is one long series of events that lend themselves to building a narrative of good fortune, followed by narrow escapes and great victories. You'll have battles that drag out for ages, that feel like you overcame a great struggle only to be left a broken mess, barely holding on to life at which point the distance to the next rest site can feel a million miles away. Maybe you'll get some fantastic combination of cards that make you feel like you're breaking the game's limits. Developers Mega Crit fully intended for you to be able to create what could be easily considered unbalanced decks, because they wanted you to have these moments of feeling incredibly powerful. Being that powerful doesn't mean you're assured victory though, you could still pull some bad hands. A long string of enemies could whittle you down to the point where even the most basic foes are deadly. I think what has really gripped me with this game, and seriously, it has gripped me, is the ebb and flow of my fortunes as I play. You'll get great runs, you'll get absolutely disastrous runs, you'll get runs that start poorly and end up amazingly. One thing I like is how at the start of each run you can choose a way to modify your starting status. For example, you could make the first three encounters drop enemy health to one hit point each, giving you a nice easy start. Or you could lose something to gain a relic, relics being modifiers that tweak various factors of your character such as what buffs they have and how certain actions play out. That little addition of picking a change to how your run starts each time gives you a feeling of extra control that roguelikes often lack. It isn't much, but it makes it feel a little less like the game screws you over when you had a hand in how it started. The narrative of Slay the Spire is the equivalent of tall tales told around a campfire, like the adventures of Conan the Barbarian or Max Rokostansky being recited to anyone willing to listen, such as how you slayed that one enemy with next to no health left, how you overcame an encounter most dire. Stories that change over and over, but what always stays the same is that there was a combatant that entered a spire with the intention of slaying it. I could go into depth on the gameplay of Slay the Spire, but other way smarter people than I have done that already, such as Mark Brown on Game Maker's Toolkit. Check out his video titled The Two Types of Randomness in Game Design, for example. Hell, maybe one day I'll be cheeky and double dip into Slay the Spire and go fully in depth on this fantastic roguelike deck builder. Slay the Spire is available on PC, PlayStation 4, Switch, Xbox One and was recently released for mobile devices. It's currently on Xbox Game Pass too, so check it out there if you can. A 
last game today is Simogo's Incredible Sayonara Wild Hearts, a synth-pop concept album in video game form that was released on PS4 and Switch in September of 2019, with a PC port in December and an Xbox One port released in February 2020. I consider this my top game of 2019 and it's largely down to how it tells a story via music and visuals in a way that very few games have done, or at least done this well. It'd be pretty easy to point out what games influenced Sayonara Wild Hearts. There's a little Sin and Punishment, a little Res, a little Ostrake Oedan, aka Elite Beat Agents. The game uses familiar gameplay to allow you to slip straight into controlling your character through the stages with as little resistance as possible. This isn't a game about overcoming a challenge, at least not a gameplay one. It's a game about experiencing a story through the medium of music. Not so much in the way a game like Gitaru Man does, it's not a rhythm action game. It's more like Deus Ex Machina on the ZX Spectrum. That game involved playing a cassette containing an experimental prog album alongside the game which would, if you were lucky, sync up to the gameplay. Thankfully, no separate cassette tapes are involved in Sayonara Wild Hearts, which means syncing the music in the gameplay isn't a concern for the player. The music in this game is composed by Daniel Olsen and Jonathan Eng, with vocals by Linnea Olson, and is heavily influenced, I'm told via wiki, by Sia, Churches and Carly Rae Jepsen. I have no idea because I don't know what they sound like. Sounds all synthy and rad to me though. Also there's a fair bit of Debussy in there for you classical fans. I know what Claire de Lune is. Also, the game features narration by Queen Latifah, which is pretty great. So what about the game's story? Well, it plays out like one long interactive music video. Our protagonist is a recently heartbroken young woman who goes on a journey of acceptance to overcome her previous heartbreaks via the medium of racing through various worlds on various vehicles and punching the crap out of her past lovers. It's as rad as it sounds. As the story starts, the heroine races through an opening stage before catching a butterfly that turns her into the embodiment of the full tarot card. There's a lot of stuff about tarot cards and the divine arcana that I'm not super familiar with because, let's face it, it's entirely outside my wheelhouse of knowledge. But put simply, the divine arcana represent her past relationships, which are then the basis for each level. You work through them, collecting hearts and avoiding various obstacles, sometimes getting the chance to fire back. At the end of each set of stages, you take on one of the arcana, the implication of the story being that in defeating them, the heroine is growing beyond past heartbreaks. This will lead up to the final set of stages where you'll meet her most recent heartbreak, the cursed arcana, the little death. This set of stages is the most intense, taking you through res style frantic shooting sessions, motorbike based chases, and even a ride on a stream of fluorescent vomit. I really like that part. What happens after you finally punch Little Death in her face is so good that it dares to make me feel things. For the story's last act, you're flung into the most visually and triumphantly insane sequence of stages I've seen in the game. The heroine confronts all those past relationships, and instead of punching them with the internalised anger she had before, she gives them a little accepting peck on the cheek. She's overcome her past pain, and accepted them as part of who she is now. The heroine has grown a little older, has grown as a person, and has found her groove again. She's the same person, but one that's cast aside her mask and accepted the person she is. It's magical stuff. I really can't stress just how well this all works. The stages are these beautiful violet drenched expressions of journeying through past events in the raddest way possible. At one point you're battling a robotic Cerberus while riding a motorbike. That's cool as heck. The story is a metaphorical allegory for personal growth and acceptance, and it's an absolute pleasure to play. The first time you start up the game you'll have to play through each stage on its own. Most of these only take a few minutes, but upon completion you can play through the entire game in the way it's intended to be, in the form of a complete album with minimal pauses between tracks. You can still play the individual stages for high scores, but personally, I just love playing through the entire thing in one go whenever I fancy a quick game. It only takes about an hour to complete, so it's a nice breezy playthrough when you fancy a break from other things. I highly recommend pumping the audio through some good speakers, or using some high quality headphones when playing to really let the excellent music envelope you fully. And that's it for today. We looked at three games that handle stories in different ways without trying to look like films. Murder by Numbers going the visual novel route, Slay the Spire with its randomised events and encounters leading to tales of near misses and great victories, and Sayonara Wild Hearts with its music-led journey of self-development and euphoric growth. 
All three engage you in different ways to produce their stories, but all have their core in traditional narrative methods. But most importantly, none of them could be told the same way without your interactions. They also all have one foot in other mediums. Murder by Numbers puzzles have their basis in puzzle books, say the Spire Boris from deck building card games, and Sayonara Wild Hearts is part concept album. They show that more can be done with stories beyond following a filmic approach, and that video games are uniquely positioned to pull off such a fusion of story and gameplay while bringing in elements of other mediums. So thank you for watching this episode, please do the usual like, comment and subscribe thing that YouTube likes me to remind you of. A special shout out goes to my Patreon backers that help me buy lunch every time one of these is made. Please do consider giving the Patreon a look. I'm not sure what's coming next on Mellow Gaming Recommends, but I'll do my best to not leave it so long next time. Sayonara Mellow Gamers.